Good evening, everybody. Hi, welcome. I'm a little overcome tonight. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just amazed. 18 months, and I am so honored to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you for trusting us, and uh, thank you for trusting the process. I see everybody's well-spaced and well-masked, and uh, I'm just so honored to be here with you tonight. So thank you again. Uh, you're probably like, who the heck are you? I'm Brandi Parisi. I'm the midday host at All Classical Portland. I'm also the host and producer of the Oregon Symphony Broadcasts, and I am so thrilled to be joined by Kenji Bunch, violist, composer, educator, all-around music rock star here in Portland. <laughs> Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. So, wow, quite a year, huh? It's been a year. Now yeah. that you mention it, yeah, mm -hmm. it's been quite a year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I think that one of, um, one of the things I'm most excited about tonight's program is that the very first notes are, that our orchestra is going to be playing for the first time together are by you. And this piece that you were commissioned to write called Time In, that I've, I've gotten a little bit of a preview about, and um, like so many of your works, it's accessible and, and lovely, but there's a lot more depth going on the more you listen. Can you tell us a little bit about Time In and what the inspiration sure. was? Well, well, the sound system works. <laughs> uh, well, um, I should first say that typically w with a, an orchestra commission, um, you, as a composer, you, you talk uh, at least a year or two in the future. And um, that, that's just the way orchestras have to plan because guest artists are busy for you know, a year or two. So to, to get the people you want, you need to book them in advance. Uh, but it was this past spring that I got the call about this project. So uh, in other words, a, a very uh, kind of short uh, turnaround for this. Um, but how can I turn that down, you know, uh, being asked to literally write the first notes, as you say, uh, that this orchestra will have performed on this stage for uh, for you, for a live audience in um, close to 19 months, I believe. Uh, and and what, what an honor that that is to uh, for them to think that somehow I could come up with something. Um, and. Uh, so it, it's a great honor, but also a huge responsibility. I can't screw that up. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't have a ton of time to figure it out. Um, the it, it, it was it, I I knew whatever I wrote, wrote it would be short, right? So if you hate it, it'll be over in less than four minutes. <laughs> um, and and just by the nature of the first fanfare type of work on a program that's that's what um, I was asked to do. So the first thing I did was think about short overture works that I really love. And um, I, I play viola, I play in, in the orchestra quite a bit. Um, I'll, I'll be playing the Mahler tonight. Um, and so I, I was thinking about overtures that I really enjoyed playing in an orchestra. And I'll tell you my top three. Okay. Um, Glinka, Ruslan, and Ludmila. Yeah. I love that one. Uh, if you haven't heard it, check it out. It's super fun and really fun to play. Uh, Bernstein's Candide Overture. I love playing. I, I, I'm, I'm a flute player, not professional, obviously, but it was one of my favorite pieces to play. It's so just much like fun. Perfect. It, it, it's so perfectly written. It, uh, it's just so much fun, so uh, buoyant and, and uh, bubbly and fun. And uh, uh, Mozart's Magic Flute. <sighs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I, I just. It, and you know that's what composers do. We we think uh, it's not enough to appreciate uh, good music. We have to take it apart and figure out exactly how it works and and why it works. What why is this so much fun to listen to? Exactly what's going on here? And so I I kind of studied those pieces and and I also knew what I wrote had to sound nothing like any of them. I I, I wanted something to sound new and fresh. 
um, but not so new and fresh that it would be painful to listen to. <laughs> so um, then the way I like to work is I, I, I like to write stuff down on paper first. I, you know, uh, normally I'll work at the computer on a software program, uh, especially for orchestra music. It just makes life so much easier to uh, use that program. But um, initially I like to have pencil on paper. And I'll, I'll write down ideas and maybe some sketches of uh, material that I come up with that I think might work. And I wrote down uh, hip hop slash Chinese opera. <laughs> and they go so well together. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's uh, that could be cool. And I I actually Googled that and uh, found some pretty interesting things. Uh, um, but what I, I wanted was um, I wanted to infuse this ensemble and the kind of tradition, the continuum of tradition that it falls into. I, I wanted to infuse that with uh, something uh, modern and of our, you know, of our time and place and. Uh, specifically of a kind of non-Western European origin. And uh, I mean, there's, there are a few things more classical than Chinese opera. It's been around a while. And um, hip hop rhythms, if you trace them back far enough, they, they come from uh, sub-Saharan West Africa from a really long time ago. So, um, I, I just I knew that that was my uh, my challenge is to somehow fit that into a three and a half minute piece for orchestra that was as fun as the Candied Overture. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. There's another piece on this program that's also inspired by um, non-Western European uh, culture, and that is a piece by Gabby Gabriella Lina. Frank. Yeah, and I know you're not playing in this, but you're familiar with this piece. Yeah, um, Gabriella's music is so incredibly uh, vibrant and colorful, and she's really a, a master of color and orchestration. And uh, if if you haven't heard anything of hers before, if you haven't heard this piece. Just think about that when you're listening to it. Uh, some of the things that, she, the, the sound she gets just from uh, like plucking the strings, uh, there's this incredible thing the flutes do in the middle of the piece. And it, it's just, it, she creates these otherworldly uh, sounds. And uh, she's, she's just a, a wonderfully creative composer, and, and it, it, it's, it's just, um, I, I love playing her music. I've played a, a few works of hers and um, love listening to it, and, and she's also uh, just a, a real um, force of nature as a musical citizen. She, she's uh, extremely nurturing of younger composers and Specifically, uh, composers of color and and female composers, and and uh, she she really walks the the walk in a lot of ways, and I, I just have a ton of respect for Gabriella Frank. One of the really exciting things going on this season uh, that I'm seeing with the Oregon Symphony is their commitment to really exploring process. And you know, you were talking about your process in writing um, Time In, which we'll hear tonight. But there's also a new series that's going to be beginning next Wednesday, and this is kind of two-part. Uh, Gabrielle Lena Frank is also a member of the advisory board for the Oregon Symphony. You're going to be hearing a lot more from her in the coming years. But you are involved in, it's, I think it's called Open... Um, open Music. Open yeah. Music, yeah. Next Wednesday at the Old Church. Yeah. And, and really exploring your process and your, your influences. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it's uh, just a, a really neat opportunity to take a kind of a deep dive into 
um, not necessarily my music, but uh, there's a little bit of my music, but also music that has influenced me, uh, that's meant a lot to me for some reason. And um, this is hosted and curated by Gabriel Kahane, uh, who is, is just a, a wonderful, another uh, just real um, great artistic presence um, who is in town now. He's, uh, it's, uh, we're, we're very lucky to, to have Gabe around here. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to keep it very intimate and informal, and uh, it, it'll be an evening of music and conversation, and who knows. Well, and this is, again, an ongoing series. I think there's four parts mm -hmm. this year, and it's a real opportunity to, to you use the word deep dive, I think as an audience to do a deep dive in a very accessible way to learn about the, the creation process for um, composers that we're so lucky to have here in our community and associated with the Oregon Symphony. So Open Music, that series starts next Wednesday at the Old Church. You can learn more about that at, uh, at orsymphony.org. So I want to get back to talk because you've got so much going on and so many cool projects going on. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, but first, Obviously, Mahler, right? Mm. Mahler too. So you were playing on uh, the Mahler Second Symphony, the Resurrection tonight. Yeah. What an appropriate symphony to open this uh, this in incredible season with, uh, the Resurrection. Right. I mean, there's so many levels there, right? There's um, the orchestra, of course, that's been silent for so long. Uh, there's this room we're in, which has been. Uh, renewed with this incredible uh, new sound system that you will notice immediately from the first notes, which I wrote, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and it, um, it's uh, Mahler's symphony, uh, his second symphony is just, it's such a, a special work. Um, and you you don't need to have experience listening to Mahler. Uh, if you've never heard a note of Mahler, I I think you will still be profoundly moved by the experience. It, it's kind of a an immersive. It's, it's it's as immersive as the symphonic tradition gets. I, I think you could say. And um, so, let me. Speak as if you've never heard any Mahler. Um, if it, it's kind of like binging the Lord of the Rings, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you you just enter this world unto itself. And in, again, it doesn't really matter if you have prior knowledge or experience of that world. You know, you don't need to speak Elvish or whatever. And um, so. It, it, it's um, it, it, it's not uptight classical music in any way. It, it's messy and uh, extreme uh, in whatever uh, direction you want to take that. Um, and it, it's it, it, it's just so full of uh, humanity. It's, it's, it's so reflective of the human experience in all its messiness, right? If, if there's anything we've learned uh, <laughs> in the last year and change, it, it, life's pretty messy. And that's to be embraced and um, celebrated, right? Our, it's our are navigating and surviving that that's to be celebrated and and so you you'll go through the whole range um there, there's there's everything there uh you might fall asleep in the middle and and that's i i, I don't mean that as a joke i i mean you know it's two hours it was like what now hour and uh 80 minutes long maybe and uh that's a normal human reaction and don't feel bad if you doze off for a second. Um, and, uh, but I, I can guarantee you that 
Uh, so the, there's this orchestra playing for an hour, and behind them is this giant chorus sitting there on the risers. And you, you'll start wondering, well, what are they doing there? What are, when are they going to actually do anything? And I can guarantee the first time you hear the chorus enter, um, it, regardless of your belief system, it, it, it's a spiritual experience. It, it's just so profound and, and so uh, beautiful. And um, uh, the, I mean, every rehearsal, every performance, it's, I feel the same way. Uh, you feel like you, you forget to breathe because it, it's so beautiful and, and such a uh, fragile moment and it's going to be quiet and, you know, this huge gathering of people who haven't been able to do this in here uh, for such a long time, to get to that moment and uh, experience that together, is, it, it's going to move you. You know, Mahler very famously wrote about a symphony, how the whole world was in a symphony, and yeah. he has endings that are devastating at times with hammer blows, and he has, you know, all these different kinds of endings. The ending of the second, though, I'm hard-pressed to think of an ending in a Mahler symphony that is more uplifting, and even for someone who is not religious, I'm not, is spiritual. Yeah. It feels like a spiritual ending in this. Yeah, and it really does, and um, isn't that interesting that just with music, like, I don't understand the German, you know, something about Mein Gott. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, it's just, it's so, uh, you know, goosebumps and just, um, it, it, it's hard to describe adequately how um, uplifting it really is. And to get there, you got to go through some stuff, right? Yes. Like, there's, there's some pretty intense... Um, devastating stuff earlier in the, the symphony. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a huge journey, and uh, Mahler treats the orchestra, I mean, it, it's such a theatrical kind of piece. You're gonna hear sounds from all over the place. I don't wanna give, give it away too much, but uh, he, he uses some offstage uh, musicians and, and, and just really creates this whole ecosystem uh, for this piece. Mahler was a conductor, and especially towards, well, I can't say late in his career because he, only, he died at 51, I believe, mm -hmm. um, but midway through his career, he started to wrestle with, is my conducting taking away from my composition, and is there a way to put more work on the, the, the creation instead of conducting? And I've been thinking a lot about that in thinking about talking with you tonight. Um, you know, you're mid, mid career, basically. You know, you're at, you know, in many ways, you, you've developed so many areas of, of this musical life that you are a, a performing musician, you play with the Oregon Symphony, you play with local groups, um, and, and you're artistic director of, of Third Angle. Fear No um, Music. Uh, sorry, Fear No Music. <laughs> Fear No Music. Um, you're also, an educator, you teach at PSU and Reed College, and you have private students, a composer, of course, and you have two children, two young children who are up and coming young musicians of their own. I've been watching your videos, you know, on social media and stuff during the pandemic. And I'm curious, you know, as you are in this place in your life now, this period in your life, do you find that your work and your inspiration is leading toward certain areas more than others? Um, that's a really good question, and uh, my answer is probably pretty different now than it would have been a couple years ago. Um, but yeah, I certainly think more about uh, education or, or just uh, generational stuff, like what am I doing to nurture the next generation, not just my own kids, but uh, other uh, kids here in town. I, I think about, you know, I'm born and raised here in Portland, and uh, I would never have gotten the opportunities I've had in my career without um, incredible support from my parents, but also 
uh, teachers, you know, wonderful mentors here locally, and I want to be able to contribute in that way to uh, the next generation. Um, the one thing, I mean, there are a lot of <laughs> a lot of ways in which I'm different from Gustav Mahler. Um, <laughs> Uh, the main one is probably that I'm not that concerned with um, leaving behind a legacy mm -hmm. as the uh, the greatest composer of all time. <laughs> that, I think that that uh, ship has sailed. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I just want to I want to be a good husband. Uh, my my wife Monica is a, a, a pianist and. Uh, executive director of Freedom Music and, and kind of uh, does the thinking uh, for me. Um, and um, uh, I, I want to be a good father. You know, I, I want my kids to uh, remember having a reasonably good time at home with me uh, when they're older. And beyond that, if I can um, make you know, bring just a little bit of uh, joy and uh, humor and healing into the world with my music and maybe inspire some kids along the way, then I'll call it good. Okay, just the nuts and bolts question. During the, the, the serious lockdown days, when we were all inside and not even, you know, going to the grocery stores as little as possible, as young children of two professional musicians, I got to know, did, did you... W was practice, uh, was it, you know, your kids, no, you have to practice two hours every day without exception, or did they just run to their instruments every day? Or, I mean, how strict were you with them when it came to practicing music? You know, I, I have to say it was actually easier during yeah. the pandemic because there wasn't a whole lot of other stuff to do. <laughs> um, and if anything, it was kind of a nice routine, mm -hmm. uh, something that they knew at some point during the day they would be doing. And... Uh, so it it wasn't it, it's never really been a, a battle like that it's um, and I, I think what makes it work is we practice with them mm -hmm. it, it's not like go into your room by yourself and practice it, it's like let's do music now which means one-on-one -on -one time with mommy and or daddy and um, you know I, I, we're lucky that they still uh, that's that's still something that seems enjoyable to them. Uh, you know, we're very aware that our days of that are probably numbered. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been uh, something that we've been really grateful to have in our, our lives um, with them and, and just, uh, you know, like for me, I, I don't know if I would touch my instrument every day if it hadn't been for this routine we set up mm -hmm. with the kids. They, they're now over a thousand days of practicing um, every day. So. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> I want to ask you um, about a project actually from last month that I think it was an incredibly inspiring, important, and um, very moving project, and that was um, a piece that you composed in collaboration with the actor George Takei. Um, and this was premiered, I believe, at the Moab Music Festival yeah. in September. And um, well, I'll let you describe it because I, 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 I've been listening to interviews about it and, and I'm hoping that it's recorded at some point, but I don't know if there's a plan for that. Can you describe what this is about? This piece? Yeah, well, um, uh, I've performed at the Moab Festival a few times over the years and the last time I was there was uh, two years ago and I played a short solo viola piece that I wrote um, a few years back called Minidoka, which is uh, inspired by a visit I took to the site of the Minidoka Relocation Center in Idaho. Um, the internment for Japanese Americans yeah, during yeah. World War II. And uh, so Michael Barrett, the uh, music director in Moab, and I were talking after that, and he said, did you know that there was a... Uh, an isolation center that was called uh, near Moab where the so-called troublemakers from some of the other camps were taken uh, for a few months and 
and sort of placed in this um, cooling tank uh, out in the desert. And it is just like a 20 minute drive from, from Moab. And that made him want to take on a larger project addressing this uh, historical issue. Um, and he approached George uh, because they had worked together before and George uh, amazingly agreed to uh, take this on and he wrote a, a script uh, about the, the whole thing ended up being about a, almost a half hour long of uh, George narrating his own uh, personal account of growing up in the camps um, and I wrote music to go with that uh, for a chamber ensemble. It's an incredibly moving story, moving piece, and again, I hope it has another life beyond uh, Moab Festival. So one more question, because they're telling us it's about time. Yeah. So the first two pieces tonight you are not playing, which is fortunate because you get to actually witness your piece being premiered for yeah. the first time. Yeah. Where are you sitting? Oh, Do you know? I'll be up there somewhere. I'll be up there somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really excited to hear it. Congratulations, and congratulations to all of us to be here. Thank you guys so much um, for joining us tonight. I do want to mention that the broadcasts from this weekend are going to be the, uh, the first broadcast of the Oregon Symphony for the season on All Classical Portland. Starting next Thursday, we will be airing concerts call, um, on our, our series Fall into the Arts, Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. through the month of October with organizations around our community, including the Vancouver Symphony, Portland Baroque Orchestra, Chamber Music Northwest, and others, culminating with the broadcast of this weekend's concerts of our Oregon Symphony, Mahler II, and music by Gabrielle Lena Frank, and of course, our own Kenji Bunch. So, uh, please do tune in. You can learn more about those at allclassical.org. I'm Brandi Parisi. He's Kenji Bunch. Thank you again so much for joining us early tonight.